All right, here it is, another episode of Let There Be Talk. It is episode number 737. How the hell are you today on this Monday out here in Los Angeles getting ready for what they say is going to be another fucking superstorm? Just rain city this year in LA. Anyway, welcome to the show. I'm just back from... Uh, Palm Springs for the weekend, a little uh, uh, comedy with my man Bill Burr and some modernism weekend, which I've been wanting to uh, go to for years. Basically, it's a week of modernism. It, it's like they set up uh, tours of all the greatest houses out in Palm Springs, everything. And I'll get into that in a minute. Before I do talk about that, I want to thank all the new Patreoners, let's get them on here right away. Also, if you are listening to the podcast, uh, pause it for one minute and then um, go and leave a review of the podcast on iTunes. Sorry, I'm looking up uh, the new Patreoners. Here they are. Tyler Fox. How are you? Cecily J. Kenny Abel. Lisa Hiani. Uh, yeah. Okay, there you go. Some of the new Patreoners and also um, somebody else. Hold on. I want to give this person a shout out because uh, they just did like a straight donation to my PayPal. Pretty, pretty fucking kind, my friend. Very kind. Let's see. Who was it? It was Zane Olofgren out there at Sacramento. Sacramento. That's what the dumb radio morning DJ would call Sacramento when I was growing Hey, it's going to be 105 out in Sacramento. Oh, 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 oh. Holy shit, that's funny. <laughs> oh, my God. Anyway, uh, thank you for the Patreon. You want to join everybody, patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Get your bonus episodes and some live Zooming out there. And the tour dates are at deandelray.com. And, uh, yeah, there you go. Merch. I don't know. All kinds. Of, I'm fucking a little sleepy today trying to get this episode fired up. I just kept chilling on the couch. Is that rain mode, man? It just gets into rain mode and you get home from the road. Oh, yeah, I got a little something on my fucking mic there. That's going to bother me. Okay. So I'm back from Palm Springs. And uh, everybody knows, if you've listened to this podcast for years, that I absolutely love Palm Springs. I have uh, been going out there for years, but I went out there a lot during COVID. I had a little fantasy for a minute. Didn't think I was going to be doing comedy anymore because of COVID. I was like, it's over. I'm going to move to Palm Springs. I really like it out there. It is just beautiful when it's not 148 degrees. Even... We were just there this weekend and we're outside and there's something about Palm Springs where I think the ozone is, you know, people say there's a hole in the ozone and everything. I think it definitely uh, is a huge hole in the ozone or something over Palm Springs because it was only like 78 degrees, but you could just feel the sun like on your fucking neck right here. Like it's tapping you like, hey. Dude, I'm burning you up here. It's only 78. Look, it's 80, 90 in LA. I'm never standing there in LA going like, fuck. It basically feels like back when you used to fry ants with the uh, magnifying glass. Remember that with the sun, just fry ants. Remember when you first learned that? It was like, you're just burning leaves in your backyard, starting mini fires with the magnifying glass. Oh, my God. Just instant fucking lighter. Whip out the magnifying glass. The bigger one, too, like the big one. And then you get that. It's got to be like a real small pinner beam. If you had the big beam, it wouldn't light. But you get the proper beam and you got some fucking smoke. That's what it feels like in Palm Springs. Even at 78 degrees, you're just sitting there going, like, oh, I'm fucking burning right now. I don't know what that is. But I absolutely love Palm Springs. And, you know, if I didn't do comedy and I wasn't afraid of the boiling heat in the summer, I'd live out there. But Gertie does not like the fucking heat. And you know what else doesn't like the heat? Your goddamn car. You just sit in your car out there 
you go in to the grocery store for a minute and you come out and your car's like, seriously, like 140 degrees. So that's a big, that's a big bummer out there. A little thing called fucking heat. But we were out there this weekend, me, Bill Burr, and uh, the great club Soda Kenny. And we went out to uh, do a couple shows at the uh, Agua Caliente Casino, I guess it was. Nice fucking casino. No cigarette smoke allowed inside. So just beautiful, man. There's nothing better than a casino with no cigarette smoke. Oh, you can just walk through it and not worry about just stinking. But uh, nice place. Great kind of a mini arena. It was kind of like this cool bowl. Really fucking nice. Josh Freeze and his wife came out. That was great to see them. Total surprise. Had no idea they were coming out. And uh, a couple other friends were there. Two sold out shows. Great audiences. And, uh, you know, we did one show Friday night. Then we woke up Saturday and we got to go to the uh, Elvis Presley honeymoon house. I had set it up uh, about a month before because Bill said, hey, here's a couple of dates in Palm Springs. You want to do them? And I go, oh, shit, that's during modernism week. So like I said, you can sign up for these tours of some of the most famous houses. Uh, one of the greatest houses, I think, of all time is the Kaufman House. Let me look that up real quick. The Kaufman House is it's just a fucking piece of it's a masterpiece of architecture. Let me see here. Kaufman. Let me see when it was built. It, and now look it up if you want. Kaufman House. And Kaufman is spelled C, uh, K-A-U-F. Uh, M-A-N-N. Kaufman Desert Home. Architect, the super, superstar, Richard Neutra. And it was built in, um, let's see when this was, 1946. Unbelievable. So right there, you got the Kaufman house. And then it, in this neighborhood, it's just loaded with some of the greatest architecture in the United States, probably in the world, as far as uh, mid-century modern. And uh, one of the guys that was really heavy involved in it was a guy named William Kreisel or Kreisel, depending on who's fucking saying his name. And I was always a fan of his because I fell in love with his work out in Palm Desert uh, called The Sandpiper. He was a guy that did kind of the first mid-century condominiums, which was unheard of back then, condominiums. People would come out from L.A., like Marilyn Monroe and fucking people like that, and stay in these condos and just chill outside of the L.A. business, man. So we went to uh, the Elvis Honeymoon Hideaway. It's the famous one that looks like a stealth bomber. And uh, William Chrysler did it. It's right next to the Kaufman house. There's like a cool fucking A-frame house there. There's a bunch of great shit right around it. And when we walked up, it was uh, really wild to notice there was like steel construction to the right and steel to the left. And right away... My insanity was like, nope, couldn't live here. That's going to be two years of fucking just noise. Just fucking trucks, beep, 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 and, and bad music in the morning. And people talking, hey, fucking Frank, Frank. And, and, you know, what was there was uh, tennis courts for the Elvis Presley honeymoon house. And to the left was just a nice open property that was kind of like an orchard, they said, and everything. And this guy bought the Elvis Presley uh, hideaway. Elvis didn't own this. He didn't live there. He was only there like three nights for a honeymoon. But this guy bought it from the original Alexandra family. And then he, he you know, sold off two plots of land in front of it and then flipped the house. Total dick move because now the next people that bought it for five point five million are living there in between these two fucking full construction sites. So that was a real bummer, man. I'm sure once the homes are done, it'll probably look amazing because they're doing mid-century style houses. But I'd much rather see a tennis court there and just an open property. But the property there is worth a fortune. So uh, me, Bill, and Kenny went inside. 
to the Elvis Presley honeymoon hideout. Apparently, he wanted to get married to Priscilla Presley in this house, but um, the old school Rhoda Barrett, remember her? She was a uh, a gossip columnist, column and evidence. She caught wind that he was there and then uh, snitched it off to other people and there's just paparazzi out there and shit. So he snuck out the back to Frank Sinatra's uh, limousine. He went through the orchards, him and Priscilla, and they drove to Vegas and got married and then came back. Wild story. This thing is known as the Elvis Presley honeymoon hideout. And he basically was in there for about 72 hours. <laughs> That's how fucking big of a star Elvis was. Anywhere he went, they'd be like, you know, Elvis lived here. Oh, yeah, how long? Well, you know, he was here about 16 hours, but, you know, he did live here for a minute. Uh, the guy that bought it and flipped it was kind of weird. You know, you get a half hour for the tour, which, by the way, shout out to Modernism Week for hooking us up, man. It was great because it was sold out. And uh, I said, hey, we're going to be in town any way we could pay to come, you know, we we didn't know we were going to be there and and they uh they did us right so um the guy that flipped it he was showing it to us and you only get 30 minutes basically 15 minutes of it he's talking about how he bought the house making the tour all about himself yeah i bought the house like five years ago you know i wanted to sleep in uh all the bedrooms and and take a bath in each bathtub and and then sell it <laughs> that fucking guy was nutty uh there's uh, some video of it on my instagram and also you can, I'm sure there's some great video on YouTube. Somebody did like pro stuff. At some points I was filming it, but then I was just looking at the house in awe and I was just filming the ground, which was all terrazzo. Uh, the floors were terrazzo, which I fucking love. This is all architect, architecture, mid-century, you know, design nerdy shit. But I can't um, recommend enough a trip to Palm Springs and just see what it would be like to live when uh, it wasn't all about just track homes or boxed apartments. It's funny, we were driving out there and there was a newer neighborhood built on the side of this hill before Palm Springs. And it was just like probably 1,200 houses that looked identically the same. It was gross. Just in there, stacked, you know, next to each other. Just identical houses. Just so Stepford Wives. You just turn down the street. Yep, yeah, here's my house. Oh, shit, that's not mine. That's that's Teddy's house. Here's my house. Oh, no, that's Suzanne and Frank's house. Yeah, I mean, it's just fucking the samey same. So to see this beautiful stuff in uh, Palm Springs is always just inspiring. And every time I go out there, it makes me want to just live there. I keep playing the goddamn lottery. It could happen. It's funny because they were talking about how the houses cost around 12 grand and every one of them was the same in this neighborhood in Palm Springs, but not the same like the bullshit I'm talking about. It was the same floor plan, but what they would do is they would turn the houses different ways and put different roof lines on them, like a butterfly roof or that kind of uh, V roof, you know, that looks like a, like, uh, like, you know, like diamonds. And then that would give it a, a different feel in the neighborhood. And man, it totally works when you're in there. You're not like, look at all these dumb houses. Like the say, it's just beautiful. They're like, they're just works of art. So we didn't get to go to the Frank Sinatra house because the show was eight o'clock and we were supposed to go to the Frank Sinatra house and the party was going to start at like five 30 or six and we we're 20 minutes away. So it was like, yeah, better not do that. But I will be back out there soon and take a, a, you know, rent a bicycle and just ride through that neighborhood. You can rent bikes in Palm Springs and just cruise around. That's the way to do Palm Springs before it becomes one fourteen out uh, at nighttime. <laughs> uh, thanks for everybody that came out to shows. Really good shows. Like I said, great casino. And uh, just kicking off the 2024 dates that I'm doing. And uh, it felt pretty good working on a bunch of new stuff. Getting ready to go to Portland on Thursday, Portland, Oregon. And then Vancouver Friday and Salt Lake 
on Saturday. Those tour dates are on DeanDelRay.com. And then in March, I am headlining Acme Comedy Company in Minneapolis. And I really, really hope that you guys buy tickets and come to this if you're out there. Or Fort Collins, Colorado. So, uh, yeah, those are some headlining dates coming up. And mic drop in San Diego. They're all on the website, DeanDelRay.com. Feeling pretty good uh, about some of this new material. Okay, so yeah, that's it, man. I was out there for the weekend. Now I'm home. I'm chilling. Um, Looking up. Oh, by the way, I talked about the sphere. Sphere. A couple weeks ago and seeing you too. And uh, I am am still in this full-blown awe Mach 2 of Octung Baby. Mach 2 being the first time Octung Baby uh you know it came out i hated it and then returned it then bought it i've told that story but right now since i went to the sphere sphere <laughs> i have been just obsessed with octung baby again just can't stop listening to it enough i was rocking it yesterday all day sunday just getting into that back half of that record love is blindness acrobat uh wild horses all of that shit just a fucking great record. Can't stop listening to it. I just want to throw that out. I do have a new band recommendation for you. Let me get this fired up for you people right here. And uh, I really like this fucking band. Somebody sent it over to me. It's called uh, Ghost Woman. And let me see if I can find out anything about it. I, I haven't really dug deep because I've just been so into the uh, music. Ghost Woman. Let's see where they're from. Ghost Woman. Here they are. Ghost Woman Musical Band. Uh, the record is called Hindsight is 50-50, and it's out right now. And if you are into some fucking desert rock, oh, they're out on tour, too. Um, you're going to want to fucking dig into this band. There's not much on their website about them. It's just tour dates. That's kind of fucking weird. Let me see if that's... Yeah, just tour dates. They're um, oh, they're doing Boise, Idaho, March twentieth through the twenty fourth, Tree Fort Festival, April twenty seventh, Austin, at the Site Festival. These guys are great. Let me see if I can find anything on them. Which is kind of a bummer that uh, there's nothing on their website. Ghost Woman. Not sure uh, where they're from. Let me see if I can find out where they're from here. This band is really fucking good, man. Ghost Woman, and it's W-O-M-A-N, not women. Here we go. They got an Instagram. Let's see what we got here. Isle plus Ivan. Europe and UK bookings. North K- North North America bookings. Yeah, nothing fucking on these guys. Really weird. Like, no, where are they from? Somebody's going to tell me. I know it. I think they might be Europe. Anyway, record hindsight is 50-50. I cannot recommend this enough. It is a fucking great, great uh, record. So I wanted to give them a little shout out out there. It's been a, a, about a month or so before I, or so since I've uh, shouted out some new music. And Ghost Woman is definitely in there. Okay. Something uh, over the last week, somebody sent me over a photo of the very first foster freeze that I um, worked at. I worked at a foster freeze when I was, I guess I was 13. I don't think you could work in California until you were 13. You had to get a work permit. Weird. You know, they you couldn't work too many hours because of school. But my buddy, Mark Gardeman, his mom owned a foster freeze. And I remember exactly what happened. I wasn't really looking for a job at 13, but you know, we grew up pretty broke, my mom and I. And I went to Guitar Center in San Francisco, the one that was on, uh, Long, not Lombard, uh, Van S. It was the old small one. It might have been, actually, it might have been the new one. No, I, I'm not sure. I can't really remember. But I remember walking in. I think it was the new one. 
And they had the Gene Simmons axe bass and they had the guitar. And I talked to Gene about this on the podcast when he was on, which was fucking highlight of my life. Unbelievable. But um, Kramer made them and it had the metal Kramer headstock. Remember that? That was kind of slit in the middle. A lot of people don't remember that early Kramer had the metal headstocks, kind of like those, like, uh, those other guitars had them too. I can't remember what they're called, the Lucite ones. Anyway, I saw the axe, uh, bass and guitar, and I wanted the guitar, which is ridiculous. I think it was something like $1,300. might have been a little more, whatever. And I was like, God, I got, I got to get that, man. And, you know, I'm coming off a paper route when you're like 10, 11, 12 which is the original uh, sweatshop. I forgot. I used to do that bit. I hate when I go into Starbucks and uh, they're like, hi, you want to donate money to get the kids out of the Chinese sweatshops? And I was like, no, no. What about me? What about what about the America sweatshop, the paper route? What about that? You know, where were you for me back then? You know, you work fucking 30 days a week getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning, you know, you had to fucking fold the papers back then, put the rubber band on them, you're all fucking black with ink. And then you put the bags on your bike and you're dodging drunk drivers. I've told the story before, like you're going down the street and you're trying not to get kidnapped and you're throwing the fucking papers up. You're not putting it on the porch. The people are screaming at you. I said, porch it, motherfucker. And then you get like a, like seriously, like $27 or something at the end of the month. So that's my first introduction into the working uh, world back when I was a kid. And the next one was foster praise. And at the time, America, the minimum wage was $3.35 an hour. I was like, $3.35. Okay, cool. You know, I'll just work. And, and you could claim exempt. So they didn't take taxes out because you were a student. So I work like a full month and I get the first check and I think it's like $90 for a month. And I'm like, oh, I'm never getting that fucking guitar. And I quickly forgot about that guitar and just focused on, I got a job now. And I was working with my buddy, Mark Gardeman. And this foster freeze happened to be right in the neighborhood where people cruised. So I was like 13 working and like, you know, like, teenagers are coming up like let me get an ice cream fuck face you know and, and girls would be like hi like flirting with you to get free ice cream you'd just be like oh yeah here you know making a fucking caramel sundae Ooh, maybe she'll like me here's a here's a caramel sundae for free <laughs> just fucking mark's mom owned the place but we're just meanwhile giving away shit my favorite thing was you got a meal each meal or each uh shift so i just fucking make my own shit, invent my own stuff. Like here's a, a triple cheeseburger with jalapenos and a caramel sundae with French fries on top. You're just doing dumb shit. And you just smell like a, a French fry fryer when you come home, you just stink. But I did that job and, you know, it was definitely early, uh, you know, introduction into work ethic because I, you know, I had to fucking ride the bus there that took like an hour. It was only like, I don't know, 20 minutes away, but the bus stopped at every stop. And and then, you know, at night I'd ride it home and then walk to the house. It was, it seemed like it might have been awful, but the memories were great. Anyway, it closed recently and it had a cyclone fence around it. I hadn't thought about that place in years. The bus stop was right across the street and just some of the memories of that, you know, like your first job, it's fucking wild. Like you're working. It's so weird to, to have a job where you go in, you had the time card you, you and then you got to put on whatever the fuck thing they make you wear. But it was cool though. It was like a, a blue work shirt and it had like Foster Freeze, the cone guy. It was an ice cream cone with eyes and shit. It wasn't cool. I don't know why I said it was cool. Looking at it now, I'd be like, that's pretty cool. But when you're when you're young and you're 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 trying to think you're cool, you don't you want to be wearing like a uh an ACDC shirt at all times. 
you know, I'd be wearing the Foster Free shirt, you know, one of those ones. Remember that on Fast Times, as soon as Judge Reinhold is going to go deliver the uh, fish and chips to someone, the guy's like, hey, hey, whatever his name is, Randy, where's your fucking pirate outfit? And he's like, well, you know, I'm getting in the car. So I'm like, you are a proud employee of the fucking buckaroo, you know, fish and chips or whatever it was. Put your outfit on. So he puts the fucking outfit on and he's driving to deliver the fucking fish and chips. And he gets to the red light and he looks to the left and it's uh, Ann Wilson or sorry, Nancy Wilson in a Corvette. And he, he's like, oh, hey, baby. And then he forgets he has the dumb fucking hat on and she just laughs at him and burns away. And he just throws the fucking pirate hat out the window. That is the fucking early work of uh dumb work uniforms you know so as soon as i got off work i'd take that fucking shirt off and get on the bus and be like this is my van halen two shirt <laughs> first job so man what was your first job what did you do a lot of people don't even fucking want to work now nobody works you know to said i was at a movie theater no one working there i just walked right in it was crazy no one wants to work. I, I don't know what happened, man. But when I was young, you, you, you got a job and then you, you know, saved up a little money, buy yourself a, a Datsun B210. <laughs> this is the non-rich kids. I went to school and there was like a rich neighborhood. And then there was like the poor people like me. It was like um, on Outsiders, the, the greasers and the socias. And, you know, the kid would come up, drive up in like a brand new fucking Mustang. And be like, this fucking rich kid. Oh, it's made me hate rich kids all my life. I don't know why. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, Foster Freeze. Great, great old school memories. And uh, did you ever eat at a Foster Freeze? They were fucking so good. It smoked McDonald's and Jack in a Box and Wendy's and Burger King. You know, they were like uh, franchised out and they were all over California. I don't know uh, how many are left. Let's see if they 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 have that here. But uh, and also, I don't know if it was just a Cal California thing. Foster Freeze. It's weird. It's Freeze. F-R-E-E-Z-E. -E -E. Not to be confused with Josh Freeze with F-R-E-E-S-E. -E. OK, there's some there's some open right now still. Whittier Boulevard. There's some in LA. Eagle Rock Boulevard has one right now. That's not too far away. I might have to fucking try it out. Here's the Wikipedia on it. Their new logo is not as cool, but it still has the ice cream cone guy. Foster Freeze is a chain of fast food restaurants in California. First location was on La Brea Avenue in Inglewood. Wow. Opened by George Foster in 1946. Still operating. That's fucking amazing. 78 years ago. Number of locations as of now, 62. The chain's name refers to its soft serve ice cream and milkshakes. Its marketing slogan is California's original soft serve. Its mascot is Little Foster, a smiling ice cream cone. <laughs> Little Foster. Got the OG logo. I'm looking at one from uh, Cloverdale, California. Now, I'd go on these long motorcycle rides up to uh, the Redwoods. And there'd be like four or five Foster's Freeze on the way. And uh, I would hit them all the time. Just bikers out there in front of a, a Foster Freeze in their leathers eating an ice cream sundae. Oh, and they had the fucking chocolate covered bananas, frozen bananas. Remember those? You just looked like a fucking, you just looked like you're giving someone a smoker while you're eating that thing. It's mm -hmm. frozen banana <laughs> smoker. Okay, George Foster moved to California after World War II to open up outlets of, di of a Dairy Queen. Since he owned the development rights in the state of California, however, state laws protected the dairy industry, preventing the use of the word dairy in his restaurant names. What the fuck? So instead, he called it Foster's Old Fashioned Freeze. That's crazy. And then he later dropped it. 1951, he sold the chain's 360 locations for a million dollars. Six, 
360 locations for a million bucks. He owned them all. By 87, it had been reduced to 80, 189 locations. That's fucking crazy. El Polo Loco signed on and bought them. That's a wild thing. It's probably boring to you, but it's just a little memory lane to me, you know? Oh, look at this. Foster Freeze in Atwater Village, which is close to me, appeared in the movie Pulp Fiction. There you go. Fucking Quentin knows how cool Foster Freeze is. It's funny. They have those type of uh, chains that are state only. Like you'll go to another state and you'll be like, oh, what the fuck is cactus time? You know, but uh, that was uh, my first. Well, I had my paper route was my first job, but that was really my first real job. And it was weird. You had to deal with people and you had to learn how to work a register uh, and you had to know how to do math. You know, like it didn't do, it didn't tell you the change. It was the fucking one you push the buttons in. Yeah, I'm fucking old. I'm 58. You press it. Okay, cheeseburger, 275. And then a fucking vanilla shake, dollar fifty. French fries, dollar. And then hit it, total. And the guy give you a 20 and you're like under the counter doing finger math. You know, like when you go on your first date and you're trying to figure out the tip, you're like, let's see here. Okay, it's it's 1275. He gave me a 20. Uh, and you're just nervous. You're fucking nervous. Hey, you he gave me the wrong change back, buddy. Trying to rip me off. Oh uh, no, no, I'm I'm 13. I just I'm nervous. <laughs> Eventually I got off the cashier and they put me over to the fucking burger flipping. Just fucking flipping some burgers, cheeseburgers, dropping some fucking chicken into the fryers. Yeah, man. Old days. Old days. I wonder if I got any uh, Social Security coming to me from the Foster Freeze days. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Rest in peace, Foster Freeze, the one I worked at. Awesome. Uh, Neil Young and Crazy Horse have announced a tour. Now, if you guys remember, I saw Neil Young a couple months ago at the Roxy for the 50-year anniversary of the Roxy. Neil Young had played the Roxy the opening night. He played it a few nights in a row. And for the 50-year anniversary, he went back and played it with Crazy Horse. He had not played with Crazy Horse in years, and it was uh, wild to see. And I thought for sure, no way. Are they going back out? Because, you know, they're up there, man. They're up there in age. So the tour is called Love Earth Tour. And it starts April 24th in San Diego, two nights. And uh, it seems to be like it's going to be outdoor amphitheater type of uh, sheds, like the Shoreline type of places, if you know the Shoreline in the Bay Area or the Greek here in L.A. But they're not playing in L.A., which leads me to believe that maybe they're going to be announced at, what is that, Stagecoach? Because there's no way you wouldn't play L.A. like the Greek or the Hollywood Bowl. It's just no fucking way. But he's doing some cool shit, like he's doing uh, Forest Hill Stadium out in Queens. That's a cool venue. So I, I got to tell you, man, if you have not seen Crazy Horse, do yourself a favor and get out there and see Neil Young on this tour, because you definitely do not know if you're ever going to see uh, Neil Young again. He has not uh, been very active in the tour world after COVID, and he has definitely not played with Crazy Horse in a long time, other than the <clears throat> the Roxy shows. So uh, I can't tell you enough how much I love Neil Young, and you have to go see this just to hear like a Cowgirls in the Sand, or any of the classic long jam, Cinnamon Girl, that stuff where they just open it up and play like 15 minutes. Unbelievable. And uh, that set list that I saw was, you know, they played the first two Crazy Horse records. Everybody knows this is nowhere. Hold on, let me see that real quick because it was, it was fantastic, man. Neil Young. Crazy horse. You, you got to go see this. Out of anybody, people go, you think I should go see such and such or such and such? I would say see this Neil Young because 
how old is Neil Young? You know, let's see. Crazy horse set list. Crazy horse set list. God, you got to love the internet. Here it is right here. Roxy. What a fucking set list. Tonight's the night. Unreal song. And then uh, they're playing, uh, come on, baby, let's go downtown. Great one. Albuquerque, unreal song. Tonight's the night. Like I said, just fire. Cinnamon Girl, everybody knows this is nowhere. And then, you know, you get classics like Down by the River, Cowgirls in the Sand. Uh, what else did I love? Oh, fucking Albu Albuquerque is just, that's just fucking, that's just a beautiful song. So yeah, that, that tour is coming up too. Let's see. It starts in April, which is weird. It just fucking dropped out of nowhere. These people seem to, uh, I mean, you know, Neil Young or, or ACDC and stuff, they can drop tours like that because the tickets will just be gone instantly. And uh, which, by the way, I wonder how the, um, the Dead & Co. tickets are selling. I'm sure they're fucking gone. I heard the ACDC tickets are already gone in Europe and they're adding like second dates and stuff, which is wild. People are asking if I'm going to have Chris Cheney on the podcast. I hope so. I hope to have him on. Um, I'm sure he's he, he had to sign an NDA, so he doesn't really want to say much. And he might not even be allowed to do interviews, actually. You know, they could have the clamp down on him. Angus and uh, Brian do the, uh, do the talking mostly. So I'd love to have Cheney on, talk about his audition, how it came about, stuff like that. Um, uh, my mom. Okay, let's see a couple more things. Thanks for tuning in today. Obviously, it's a solo episode, or it would be the longest intro ever. Like, oh, okay, my guest today is uh Gertie. Gertie's over there on the couch waiting, snoring, and uh, she wants to talk about her new food. She's pissed off that uh, her old food company went out of business, and uh, <laughs> the Gertie interview is right around the corner. Let's see. Okay, I guess that's about it. Other than um, the tour dates, one more time, give you a little rundown. Podcast is brought to you by, actually, Standard and Strange, my one-stop shop. And uh, they are the best for denim and boots and leather jackets, all of that. Standardandstrange.com and Banker Guitars. Get yourself a boutique guitar. Banker Guitars. Both are on Instagram. Both are incredible companies. And uh, I love them. I love them both. Banker Guitars. Get yourself a Karina V or an Explorer. Or get a, a, a Junior. The old Devil Cutaway TV Junior. Oh, my God. I just saw that... Uh, Brent Hines from Mastodon. He got another guitar from the great Matt Banker. Oh, speaking of that too, this uh, this Marcus King has been dropping a bunch of new songs from that Rick Rubin record, and each one is absolutely fantastic. So uh, dig into the tracks he's been dropping. Mood swings. It's just fire. This song, Mood Swings. This guy's got a he's got a classic record. Uh, on his hands again another great fucking record i've heard the whole thing and i can't wait for you guys to hear it also and he dropped some tour dates he's going to be up in uh, portland i saw the old crystal ballroom i did that place with marcus that's where the woman did the green out just passed out face down i'm looking forward to going to portland this weekend i absolutely love it great food and uh who knows what the weather will be like but Portland, Vancouver. I'm looking forward to Vancouver again. And then Salt Lake's always fun. So those are the dates. DeanDelRay.com. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel too. I love you guys. Have a great week. Stay safe out there. And if you are uh, coming to the shows, let me know. Hit me up on the uh, Instagram. Don't forget, one more time, leave a review on iTunes. See you later.